Hey, so we're live, yes? Terrific. Hey, folks, uh, good evening. We're super happy to have you. Um, apologize for the delays. Uh, I'm sure you can appreciate this, uh, technical difficulties. So uh, it really is 7.50 here in Atlanta. And um, so we're a full 20 minutes behind. But hey, listen, we are super excited that you're able to join us this evening. Um, so by the way, I'm Greg McDonald, and this is Lynn McDonald. Uh, we're, we're your co-host tonight. And uh, joining us tonight is uh, Dr. David Geshe. Hey, David. Hey, good to see you guys. And welcome, everybody. Very good. And it's great to see you, David. Um, uh, so, hey, for, for those of you who are not familiar with the um, speaker series, we created this uh, earlier this year, um, really with the specific intent on um, creating an ongoing series of talks that are not only educational, but um, designed to help equip you for this journey that most of you, like us, didn't sign up for, right? And um, <clears throat> so our goal in doing so is to uh, not only equip you, but to add clarity um, to things that you have questions about, um, to provide hope, because there positively is hope on this journey. And um, so uh, what, what the series is not about. Um, so we don't have any intention or desire um, to be telling you what to think, um, telling you what to do. Uh, we believe the Holy Spirit is more than capable of speaking to you in his way and in his time. And um, so, um, you know, also something I'd like to share with you is that for many of us parents, when we learn that we've got an LGBTQ child, oftentimes we, we feel very alone. We feel like this is unique to us, right? Mm -hmm. Like how many of you feel that way where it's like, oh my gosh, no one else knows about this. And um, the reality is you're in good company tonight. So there's, um, there's over 450 um, parents, pastors, ministry leaders joining us tonight um, from 44 states. Um, Puerto Rico, and uh, eight foreign countries, including Australia, uh, Austria, Canada, Ireland, uh, New Zealand, the Philippines, uh, South Africa, uh, yeah, South Africa, and the United Kingdom. So for those abroad, welcome. We're tickled pink that you're here. And um, uh, before we get going any further, um, I would like to uh, just open us with a word of prayer. So um, with that, Heavenly Father, God, it's great to call on your name. And uh, Lord, um, <laughs> these, these technical difficulties that come about, it's so easy to uh, get us off our mark when that happens. And, uh, but Lord, we just are so grateful that you're in control, that you uh, love us the way that you do, that you're crazy about our kids. And uh, Lord, that though so often um, when we learn about our children being um, uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, um, uh, it catches us flat-footed, it catches us by surprise. And yet, God, we know it doesn't catch you by surprise. So, Lord, we believe that you have a plan, that you have a purpose um, for us, for our kids. Uh, we pray, God, that uh, you would bless each and every family that's represented on <clears throat> the Zoom call this evening. Uh, we pray, too, God, that you would build a tall, fiery hedge of protection around them uh, and their families, their loved ones. And, um, and, Lord, it's in your son's name that we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So um, we're going to go ahead and get started. Lynn, would you like to uh, introduce um, our guest tonight? Absolutely. Um, I am thrilled to be able to do that tonight. I, uh, I, but before I go ahead and do that, I know that um, a lot of you may know of David Gushy and have, have read his books, but many of you might not. And so I'd like to go ahead and, and read... Um, Dr. Gushy's bio uh, and just um, share uh, some of his many uh, qualifications. So David Gushy received his PhD from Union Theological Seminary, New York. He is the Distinguished University Professor of Christian Ethics at Mercer University, Chair of Christian Social Ethics at Free University Amsterdam, and Senior Research Fellow. Intern National Baptist Theological Studies Center. Dr. Gushy is the elected past president of both the American Academy of Religion and the Society of Christian Ethics, signaling his role as one of America's leading Christian ethicists. 
Mm-hmm. He is the author, co-author, editor, or co-editor of more than 25 books and approximately 170 book chapters, journals, articles, and reviews. His most recognized works before 2014 include Righteous Gentiles of the Holocaust, Kingdom mm-hmm. Ethics, The Sacredness of Human Life, with his 2014 book, Changing Our Mind. Mm. One minute. <laughs> for those of you. And then after evangelism, (laughs) uh, he has been charting a theological course for post evangelical Christians, a course he more personally relates in his memoir, Christian, um, uh, still Christian. Now with the recent publication of the accessible introducing Christian ethics, these works are broaden, have broadened his readership considerably. Over a full 29 year career, mm-hmm. he's been a devoted teacher as Professor Gushy to college students, seminarians and PH students. He's also led activist efforts on climate torture and LGBTQ inclusion. Mm-hmm. And he is a keynote speaker at churches, forums and university. To say David is qualified to speak on this subject really underestimates uh, that. So, and you know, the one thing I want you to know about David after reading all that, I mean, it's like, whoa, that is a lot. Um, But he is so down to earth and his love for people, David, your love for people is contagious. And you have this gentle spirit about you that I, I, we just love. And we are just so grateful that God had allowed our cross to pass, mm-hmm. uh, to uh, our paths to cross. That too. And um, <laughs> and your your heart is is as big as the outdoors. So with that being said, I am honored to introduce Dr. David Gushy. Wow. Well, thank you. <laughs> um, that is very kind. Um, and thanks to all of you who fought through the technical difficulties, uh, and I imagine some more will will do so over the next few minutes. Um, Greg and Lynn, I have happy memories of our uh, meals together at mm-hmm. uh, diners in the Atlanta area, and I look forward to another one after we uh, after we have this experience. And again, it's good to good to be with you all. I wish I could see your faces from all around the world and all around the United States. Uh, this is. Uh, still to me a kind of an odd way to communicate, but it is how we do it these days. And I trust that um, the spirit of God is present just as if we were in the in the room together. Uh, by the way, you're looking, I'm in my basement office in Atlanta. Uh, the pictures behind me are of uh, four generations of my family. Um, and uh, sometime if you could come, I-, I would introduce you to all of these precious people in my life. Um, But anyway, so welcome to my office in the basement uh, of my home in Atlanta. I'm a Christian first. The way I the way I think about my story is um, uh, I was called out of nowhere to a born again salvation experience when I was 16 years old. Mm. I literally wandered into a Southern Baptist church uninvited on a Friday afternoon. Nowadays, the security guard would probably tackle me, right? But back then, I was uh, I was uh, allowed to wander into the building, and four days later, I had prayed the sinner's prayer and invited Jesus to be the Savior uh, and Lord of my life. Um, I was baptized maybe three weeks later. About six months after that, I felt called to be a pastor, and that calling never never went away. Uh, and, and the whole thing happened in a Southern Baptist setting, and so I, I, um, I was a Northern kid, really. I lived in Northern Virginia. My parents were from Pennsylvania and Massachusetts, so I had to learn how to be a Christian, how to be a Baptist, and how to be a Southerner all at the same time, and uh, there were a lot of challenges. I had to learn to drink iced tea, for example, which, which was a real challenge. Never did really learn how to drink iced tea. Uh, anyway, so called to uh, to become a pastor, and I, I don't think that's ever gone away. I care deeply about the care of souls, about, about the gospel being accessible to people, um, about people knowing that Jesus loves them. 
and uh, lived for them and died for them and has a beautiful life for them. Um, I, I went off to Southern Baptist Seminary in Louisville right after college as a 22 year old, uh, freshly married to my wife, Jeannie. Uh, she went into nursing and I went into ministry. Uh, about two years in, I discovered of all the things that they were teaching me at seminary, the one that I liked the best was Christian ethics. Christian ethics is essentially the discipline that studies um, how uh, Christians are to live their lives in the moral dimension. You know, theology studies Christian doctrine and um, church history studies the history of the church, et cetera. Christian ethics studies Christian morality, uh, how we live, what our character qualities should be, uh, what we should do in, in all kinds of complicated areas of real life and what we should say uh, into, the, into the world. So, so I went to pursuing that third calling. I went to Union Seminary in New York. I wanted some diversity in my training, um, get out of the South, experience a broader world. And so in 1993, I finished um, my degree with a dissertation on the Holocaust. I wrote about Christians who rescued Jews during the Holocaust. And that became my book, Righteous Gentiles of the Holocaust, that Lynn mentioned. Uh, came out in 94, so my career is now almost 30 years old. Um, and since, you know, since those days, I would say I've been attempting to do those three callings, to follow Jesus faithfully like I promised to do when I got baptized in the summer of 1978, to, to shepherd uh, the sheep of God, especially the most vulnerable ones, those little lambs um, that are most vulnerable, and, uh, and to, to reflect, write, and, and teach about the moral dimensions of life, issues ranging from economics to abortion to war to marriage and divorce um, to the environment to race um, to end-of-life issues and yes, to uh, sexuality. So to that end, I've written a lot and lectured a lot and, um, and so on. And um, I, I want to say that um, the ministry that, that Greg and Lynn and the team are, um, have put together here is a very tender and important ministry. Um, it's, not, it's not so much ideologically driven as it is heart driven, it's it's about, as I understand it, about um, parents being able to go on the journey with their children when their children come out as LGBTQ. It's about keeping those relationships alive and the conversation going, so that no child in a Christian family would ever believe that they had been rejected by God uh, or by their parents or by their brothers and sisters or by their aunts and uncles or their grandparents. Um, and I think that's sacred work. Mm. Uh, how we get there um, is gonna vary, different, uh, different ways to get there, different approaches. But also I'm aware that, that the main constituency for this ministry is um, people who come from the conservative part of the Protestant Christian uh, world. Uh, often known as evangelical, uh, maybe even fundamentalist in some settings. And I know from ministry and from research and lots and lots and lots of relationships that, that it's proven kind of difficult for families in the evangelical community to, um, to, to wrap their minds around their kids coming out as LGBTQ um, and to be able to think about it in a way biblically and theologically that that is life-giving and that can can keep them on the journey with their children, keep them in relationship with their children, but also uh, feeling like they're not turning their back on the Bible or on Jesus or on the integrity of their faith. Mm. Uh, yeah, hey, David. So um, uh, let me interject if I could just for a second. Yeah. Um, so something that's very special about this evening, <clears throat> when uh, when Lynn and Dave and I were talking earlier uh, about uh, tonight, David said, hey, please make sure that you leave plenty of time for Q&A. 
Um, he said, I really want to answer uh, as many questions as possible. So uh, as David uh, speaks this evening, uh, please keep that in the back of your mind. And just to tell you a little bit more about where his heart is on that, I sent him a note the other day and I said, hey, David, are you using slides? <laughs> and David said, no, it's just me, my Bible, and the people. And so um, sit back and enjoy the evening, but please um, uh, uh, start entering your questions as, uh, as you see fit. And <clears throat> excuse me, and um, we'll look forward to uh, doing Q&A later. Thanks, Craig. Um, so the talk, this uh, talk is called um, something like uh, Transformative Encounters and Paradigm Leaps. I believe that's what we called it. It's based on a chapter in my book, Changing Our Mind, uh, chapter 17 in the third edition, the last edition. Um, and here's the main idea. And I'm going to illustrate this with two biblical passages and then a couple of stories from history and then a couple of stories from my life. I'll be as brisk as I can be. Um, I know we started late, so it feels like we're well into the time. Um, the main idea is that God speaks to us through people, through our experiences with people. And um, we know this, if we have had really much experience in, as Christians or, uh, or in churches or in Christian communities of any type, we know that some of the most amazing moments of God speaking to us is through a, a conversation with somebody in a Bible study or um, somebody, somebody is, says something about how a, a Bible passage should be interpreted and, and we say, wow, how'd you get there? I never thought about that. And, and they say, well, there's an experience I had in my life that helped me to get there. And, and, and then they're able to share that. Um, but I think sometimes in our churches, we are trained sometimes, not always, but we are trained to be doubtful about that claim that God speaks to us through other people. Um, because maybe we've been taught that the only way that God speaks is through the Bible. And so if somebody says, I know that I have interpreted the Bible in such and such a way, but, but man, I, I met somebody or, or, or I had a conversation with somebody or I was in a group and, and a whole new angle of vision or they told a story that really shed new light. There's some of us in our traditions were trained uh, not to trust those stories or those experiences, but to, to say what's, no, it's really only about uh, biblical revelation. Um, and so I, I, was, I was thinking about how when we discover that a loved one at our church or in our family is LGBTQ, we are presented with dramatically new interpersonal information and dramatically new uh, human material, you might say, for theological reflection. We never anticipated that we were going to be in this conversation. We didn't, we didn't ask for it. But all of a sudden, here is a beloved human being in front of us who is telling their story about their life, their experience, their struggles, and also their dignity, their desire to be treated with respect, to, to be included. And, and that interpersonal encounter, if we are human beings at all, and if we have love in our hearts at all, that interpersonal encounter or that set of encounters is going to matter. It needs to matter to then what we bring back to the study of scripture. Um, or how we think about where Jesus is or what God's spirit is telling us. I thought, I wonder if there are examples in scripture where encounters with people um, change the way people read the Bible. And of course, there are plenty. Um, two that I would like to tell you about. Um, let, me, uh, let me read you my account of the Emmaus Road journey in Luke chapter 24, 13 through 34. This is in Changing Our Mind, available at fine booksellers everywhere. All right, here we go. 
in in this story, the two heartbroken disciples are discussing with what they believe to be a stranger, the shattering of their dreams that the Messiah had come. Jesus had just been murdered on the cross, and they say they had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. It turns out, of course, that the person they are talking with is Jesus himself, but they can't see him for who he is early in the story. They tell the story as they now see it. He was a prophet. He, he did mighty works. We thought he was maybe the Messiah, but he was crucified. And so we're walking away from Jerusalem and going somewhere else, going back to our lives. And then the mysterious stranger says, oh, how foolish you are, how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then, and then enter into his glory? The text goes on to say, then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. That's Luke 24, verses 26 and 27. Finally, after a, a mysterious meal with him, they recognize him in the breaking of the bread and then he vanishes. No biblical scholar argues that first century Jews expected a crucified Messiah. None. There was no expectation of a crucified Messiah in the first century Jewish world. Nor was there any expectation that a Messiah would come um, and that the world as a whole would, would not be fundamentally transformed towards a world of justice uh, and total redemption. Um, the, the main stumbling block really and for the the traditional Jewish community in terms of believing in Jesus as the Messiah is precisely this. Um, I had a, the guy, one of the guys, uh, Rabbi Irving Greenberg, who was my PhD supervisor, he said Jesus could not have been the Messiah because he did not transform the world. Messiahs transformed the world. Um, but for the early Jewish and then Gentile Christians, their transformative encounter with Jesus, especially the risen Jesus, led them to a huge paradigm shift. Uh, I call it a paradigm leap because it's bigger than a paradigm shift. Despite the prevailing Jewish interpretation about what the Messiah would be, they believed that Jesus actually was the promised Messiah, even though he had been crucified. Their old paradigm of how to read what the Hebrew Bible said about a Messiah did not survive their transformative encounter with the crucified and risen Jesus Christ, or for that matter, with the Holy Spirit later. So you might say it was, you had an old paradigm that was shattered by a transformative encounter with a person, in this case, the risen Jesus, that led to a new paradigm, to a new reading of scripture, in which the crucified and risen carpenter from Nazareth was understood to be the Messiah, God incarnate, and the Son of God. Jewish Christians were those who made this paradigm leap, and non-Christian Jews were those who did not. And that was a fateful schism, uh, and that breach was never really healed. But it seems pretty much inconceivable that, that, that those believers could have made that paradigm leap just from reading the Bible. They read it from rereading the Bible in light of their encounter with Christ after the resurrection. Another uh, text that I think is uh, pivotal in the same vein is the story of Peter and Cornelius in uh, Acts chapter 10. I love this passage. I think it's extraordinary. You know, you could do a weeks on this passage, but remember how it goes. First, there's a centurion named Cornelius who God sends a vision and tells him to go see Simon. Um, and so they, he, he starts, he and his cohort, his group start on the journey. And then Peter, uh, has a vision on the rooftop and three times, uh, has the vision of all those unclean animals and says, get up and eat, get up and eat, says the voice. And Peter says, no way. Um, I have never eaten anything that is profane. And the voice says, what God has made clean, you must not call profane. That's part of the journey. And so as he's thinking about this, Cornelius arrives. Peter has already been softened up because he's had this experience through the Spirit. And the next day, already breaking precedent in, in many accounts, breaking Jewish law, he goes with Cornelius 
to his house. And um, and Peter talks about how crazy it is for him to be even in the room with these folks. He says in verse 28, you yourselves know that it is unlawful for a Jew to associate with or to visit a Gentile, but God has shown me that I should not call anyone profane. Then Cornelius gets a chance to tell his story. And then Peter is transformed by the encounter with Cornelius. And in verse 34, he says, I truly understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. So, so Peter is coming around to the dramatic conclusion that this is the moment in which uncircumcised Gentiles are going to be welcomed into God's covenant. And it took a combination of, you might say, a vision um, and and then somebody else responding to a vision, but then it's the personal encounter with Cornelius and, and the, the people in Cornelius's group that leads him to this new interpretation of scripture. Suffice it to say that there is no way that Peter would have made this change apart from the encounter with Cornelius. The interpersonal uh, engagement was pivotal, all of it fueled and directed by the spirit. Um, and so, so I began thinking about transformative encounters with people being the mediating soil within which new readings of scripture and new kinds of relationships become possible. And as you actually look through church history um, and you see that paradigm repeat itself, um, I'll give you three examples. Um, in the battle over the moral legitimacy of slavery in the 19th century, um, in many ways, the stronger biblical literalist argument was on the side of the slaveholders, not on the side of the abolitionists. I mean, after all, you have all those laws uh, acknowledging and accepting slavery, and then you have the teachings of you know, Paul, like slaves obey your masters as is fitting in the Lord. Um, and so many people, that was it. That's all they needed. They had those texts. But I remember reading um, uh, a book like Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harriet Beecher Stowe. And, and what's interesting is that, um, is that it's the encounters with suffering slaves or runaways or former slaves telling their stories, revealing their dignity, you might say incarnationally demonstrating the wrongness of slavery. Those kinds of encounters with African Americans, slaves, ex-slaves, runaways, and so on, help to make possible a new way to read scripture in which American slavery was not understood to be compatible with God's will. Um, another example is during the colonial period in Latin America, when the Spaniards and Portuguese were quoting scripture to justify the conquest and enslavement of the indigenous peoples of Central and South America. Um, and they had all their scriptures all lined up, but, but leaders like Bartolome de las Casas, who I write about in another one of my books, um, said, having encountered these human beings whom we are victimizing, he said, we, we must treat them as the children of God that they are. Uh, it was his transformative encounters with the indigenous populations that led him to a rethinking of scripture. And then the last example, and I talk about it in Changing Our Mind, is there was a long, long history of Christian anti-Semitism, hatred and contempt and uh, mistreatment of Jews. And it was justified with lots of quotes from the Bible and then lots of quotes from the church fathers. Um, and it only really became abandoned as a mainstream Christian tradition. There were a few who were doing it before the Holocaust when they saw how how devastating and dangerous anti-Semitism really was, but really as a mainstream Christian move, it only happened after the Holocaust. In other words, people began to read the Bible differently because they learned from, for example, survivors of the Holocaust who talked about what it was like to engage anti-Semitic Christians when they were on the run for their lives. And in my dissertation, I wrote about those Christians who overcame that anti-Jewish tradition to save Jews and those that didn't, mostly they didn't. Now, let me tell you um, just three personal stories of my own transformative encounters. 
when I moved to Atlanta, I started going to a church in Decatur, and this was the first place I had ever been in a church where there were uh, openly gay people. And I remember, uh, this was around 2008, going to a dinner party at the home of Chuck and Bob. They were a gay couple. And um, so they invited us over for like a, you know, Saturday night, Sunday school dinner party. Remember when people used to do that? Remember that? Um, and one thing that what I remember about that first night, well, I was first like, wow, I'm going to dinner at the house of a gay couple. This is new. But then I remember they showed us into their library. And Chuck and Bob had a massive Christian library with lots of conservative books. Um, and, you know, here's, uh, and lots of mainstream evangelical books. Here's Rick Warren. Uh, here's C.S. Lewis. Here's, uh, you know, uh, Andy Stanley, of all people, you know, here's, here's uh, Charles Stanley, there was all, all there. And, and, you know, I remember thinking in all of my naivete back then, wow, so gay men read Rick Warren too. Okay. That was a mild transformative encounter in which I learned to no longer be so sure about the idea that gay people are liberals and Christians are conservatives and they're not ever in the same category. You know what I mean? Um, and then I want to tell you about a, a lesbian couple partnered with an adopted daughter named, uh, the, that couple was named Evelyn and Kate, and they were in my Sunday school class. And I remember uh, when they were considering the possibility of joining the church, and in a Baptist church, the way you join is by walking down the aisle and presenting yourself for membership. It's a pretty big deal to get up out of your chair, to walk down the aisle, and to submit you and your family for an immediate vote. That's how, that's how it was done in that church. So I remember with tenderness how tremblingly scared they were when they came to me and to our pastor asking this question. If we walk down the aisle together as a family, will we be accepted as a family? What do you think, David? Do you think it'll be okay because we couldn't bear it if they voted no. We could never recover from that. We could never come back. And of course, with Baptist democracy, you don't know what's going to happen, but we, we were pretty confident that our church would not reject them. And then they did walk down the aisle one Sunday, and they were warmly welcomed, and another threshold had been crossed. But you know, that was not, not that far away from times where in Baptist churches, uh, like gay or lesbian couples would walk down the aisle separately and pretend not to be a couple so that they could be accepted as individuals. Um, but this was, this was a family and they wanted to be able to be treated as a family and they were treated as a family. That was a transformative moment. And then, and I write about this dear friend um, who's always allowed me to use his name. His name is Theron, still one of my dearest friends. He was also in my Sunday school class he was the most devout, the most biblically serious, the most evangelistic, the most mission-oriented person in our Sunday school class. He had been a fundamentalist pastor, um, and then he came out as gay in his adult years. He lost everything, um, his church, uh, his friends, his community, but most painfully, uh, he lost his father. He one day privately told me the story about when his father was dying and um, Theron went to see him in the hospital. He hadn't been, he hadn't talked to him for years because his father wouldn't talk to him after he came out. So Theron went to see his dad in the hospital. He wasn't, he, he just wasn't gonna not give it a try. So he went to the hospital, he stood at the door and, um, and as, as I recall, he basically said, um, could you tell my father that Theron is here? And the dad, the last words Theron ever heard his father say were, I don't have a son named Theron. And that was it. He was turned away at the door and uh, Theron never had another word with his father. And Theron's father did that because he believed that that was what Christianity required of him. And that is what we must prevent from ever happening again to another child of whatever age on this planet. Actually, I have one more story, a more recent one. 
during the Zoom days in 2020, I was invited to speak to a uh, Baptist college out in the Southwest. And uh, one of the young ladies who was in that class looked me up. I wasn't talking about LGBTQ. I was talking about something else, but maybe she knew about my work. One of the young ladies looked me up and asked if we could talk. And she said, um, she said, at spring break, I went home to my family and I decided it was time to tell them that I think I might be a lesbian. She was like 20, 21. She was not in a lesbian relationship. She had had no sexual contact with anybody. Um, all she said was, I think I might be a lesbian. The response of her parents was to literally kick her physically down the stairs and then out of the house to banish her from the home. And that was not enough. They then felt the need to call the, the, the Baptist college where she was a student to, to out her to everybody in authority at that Baptist college to tell them not to renew her scholarship, um, to call the ministry she was involved in and to tell them to kick her off of all of her ministries. And what was her crime? Her crime was she had tentatively attempted to reveal to her parents that she might be a lesbian. So what have I learned from these kinds of experiences? Here's where I will close. First, there are lots of LGBTQ people in and outside of our churches. Second, they're just as diverse as any human population anywhere. They are liberal and conservative. They like hymns. They like rock music. Um, they vote Republican. They vote Democrat. Uh, they like um, they like Rick Warren. They like uh, you know uh, Philip Yancey. Uh, who knows? Um, they are human beings in our families, in our churches, all around us, and must be engaged in their diverse humanity for who they are. Labeling and, and um, dismissing people or grouping them into categories that, that misses that reality, humanity and diversity is just not right. Thirdly, they are almost always wounded, sometimes severely scarred, by the negative experiences that they have had in their Christian schools, churches, youth groups, colleges, and sometimes their families. Um, these wounds have come from those who are closest to them, which sometimes create severe issues of trust and trauma. Like any other human beings, they want to be loved and accepted. And like most people raised in church, they want to be able to follow Jesus. Um, and they want to know that we will bless them in their effort to follow Jesus and go on the journey with who they are, oh, not just accepting them if they become who we wish they were or who we thought they were or who, who we envisioned them to be. Um, since I wrote Changing Our Mind, I have been constantly reinforced in my conclusion that that we must change our minds and our hearts, and that a major way to do that is to open ourselves radically to listening to LGBTQ people, beginning with those closest to us. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's, what, it's what makes learning possible, to listen in love. And when we do that, we might find our 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 readings of scripture um, fundamentally changed. But most fundamental, I, I, I would say, is every child of every age needs to know that they are unconditionally loved by their family. And, um, <clears throat> and the church, the churches have been one of the main places in which that has not happened. And we need a revolution of that and um, I hope that this conversation tonight is part of that revolution. I'll mm. stop there. Mm. David, um, thanks, thanks so much. Um, that's some powerful stuff. Um, but my head's, my head's spinning. Uh, you know, um, your book uh, back in 2014, um, Changed Our Mind, 
just had a, a radical impact on my journey. It was a, a huge turning point for me. And it's largely because of uh, what you described tonight, you know. Um, uh, David, some time ago, you had uh, said that um, this is not a settled matter of interpretation, right? That that's a, an area of scholarly debate, I think is what I heard you say. And um, I would love for you to talk just a touch about that, because I think for so many uh, of us parents, uh, especially when we come from conservative backgrounds, we view this as you know, something that it's just, it's settled. And, um, and anyways, your, your, your conversation really helped me a lot. I'd love for you to talk about that just a touch. Well, the, um, the development of Christian moral thinking is, is something that, that is ongoing in every generation, right? If you have a historical sensibility and much knowledge of history, you can actually see Christian thinking evolve about about all kinds of things. Um, I could have offered another half dozen examples um, how uh, men talked about and thought about women. You know, it used to be that women were treated as the primary source of sin in the world because of Eve, right? How many of your pastors are, are teaching women are the gateway of sin into the world? I hope not, I hope it's not happening, but it used to be. Um, I was reading a book today for a new book project that was about how anti-Semitism was routinely taught in, in both Protestant, well, Protestant, Catholic, and Orthodox churches um, until, and then in some cases it's still there, but mainly has been renounced. Um, we used to teach that the environment was ours to, um, to do with what we want because it says in Genesis, have, uh, have dominion. So dominion means you can do whatever you want. Now we understand that if we do just whatever we want, we are poisoning the nest that we all depend on for clean air and clean water and a livable temperature. Um, so the way certain Bible passages were translated, the way uh, those Bible passages were interpreted led not only to rejection of LGBT relationships, but a rejection of LGBT people with the most ferocious uh, terminology of contempt and rejection. Ferocious, and I talk about that in the early part of Changing Our Mind. Um, contempt is the right word. Language of perversity and so on dominated the day. Even that shows evidence of change because there are not too many pulpits in which that kind of hateful rhetoric is routine now. That's growth, that's change. So. So I guess what I'm saying is God's spirit is alive and real. Um, the teachings of Jesus in scripture don't change, but what we make of them with the help of the spirit and learning from all the relevant information around us can grow and evolve. And that's, that's a, one way into the, to the understanding that maybe the existence of lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people in the world is not, is not a sign of human sinfulness, and the acceptance of such people is not a sign of cultural decadence. Maybe it's part of the mysterious diversity of the world that we live in, and, and, and maybe what we're called to do in response to that diversity is to learn broader and more expansive ways to love our neighbor as ourselves. So the norm doesn't change. Love your neighbor as yourself. The application of that norm might, our understanding of that might change as we get new information, um, as we listen, uh, and um, as we um, take in new possibilities. Um, and so, so for those who say this issue is settled, they're, they're occupying a spot on the theological and moral spectrum. I understand that spot, but there's a broader spectrum of conversation and if you understand the broader spectrum, that there's definitely that issue is not settled. Good. Hey, for for the uh, for the audience, by the way, um, we're unable to uh, respond when you raise your hand. So uh, do make sure that uh, when you have a question, just go ahead and type it in um, the uh, the Q and A, and that'd be great. And actually, we have um, 
we have some questions from the audience. One uh, that I'd like to ask you, David, um, what is the most loving approach to protect my child, the vulnerable one, when someone in our family says things disrespectfully or not treating with dignity to their face? That's a good question. That's the right kind of question, right? Um, because, because I think parents are protectors of their children. And wow, I get emotional about this. Mm. Um, I think I think you you say a clear no at the time if your mind and heart are able to swivel that quickly. Let's say it's grandma. Grandma says something. And you have to say, you know, mom, grandma, uh, I'm sorry, that crosses the line. We'll talk about this later. And then at the first opportunity, um, you say to mom or grandma, here's the ground rules for talking to my child or about my child. Um, and you may not agree on this or that, but my home is or the dinner table when we're all together or whatever is not going to be an environment in which one of my children is treated disrespectfully. Mm -hmm. um, I, that's, it's hard. And see, that's one of the interesting things about being related to and an ally with LGBTQ people who we love is that whatever negative attitudes or biases or prejudices or e even contempt or hate or fear that that maybe our family members or other ones in our circle, our friends might have accrued over their lifetime, that there's always the risk that that's going to get dumped on, on our children and on us. You know, uh, how many times have people said to me, I decided to accept my child and my parents said, it's either, you know, it's either us or your child, you, you can't have a relationship with both because we can't bless sin and we can't be associated with somebody who blesses sin or something like that. Um, you know, uh, solidarity is a word that is used in ethics to describe when we come into deep, committed partnership um, and alliance with somebody, especially somebody who is vulnerable. Solidarity, I love that word. Mm -hmm. And so in, in essence, it's like you throw a protective blanket or arm around a vulnerable group or people and you say, to the best of my ability, I will not allow you to harm this person. Mm. That is exactly what rescuers of Jews did during the Holocaust. Yeah. The, Nazis, the Nazis were trying to come get them and, um, and kill them. And rescuers were like, literally over my dead body yeah. to, get, to get to these people. Mm. And because of their solidarity, lives were saved. As many as a quarter million or more Jews survived the war because of the solidarity of rescuers. Wow. And, and David, I, I, know, I know you did, I think I, I was, I, for your doctorate, I think you did a piece on, on the Holocaust. And um, one of the thoughts that comes to mind is um, not the rescuers, but the bystanders. Right. right. So and and so often, like the 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 uh, question that was just asked, you know, families together, the vulnerable child gets attacked, um, and to you know to not be a bystander to that, right? A bystander is a person who stands by when somebody is being harmed, um, and there were there are always bystanders in situations where people are being mistreated. Um, sometimes they're standing by mutely because they're scared or because they're confused or because they haven't quite been able to get organized internally in their minds and hearts to figure out what to do. But I found that in most situations where one group is being mistreated by another group, the largest group is the group of bystanders. It's like on the playground when a kid is being bullied, right? If you got two kids being bullied by three kids, or four kids, or five kids, then you got 75 other kids who are there watching on neither side. They're just watching. That's what bystanders are. Um, when you 
become really sensitized to the frequent mistreatment and even the casual denigration of LGBTQ kids, like in youth groups or whatever, um, then being a bystander becomes less and less of an option. We can maybe, no matter what our theology, we can agree on this. I will not be a bystander to anybody suffering. Certainly not to the suffering of my own children. Okay. You know, David, that we have another question that um, we get all the time from our conservative parents who reach out to us. And, uh, and this particular person asks, do you think LGBTQ are sinful? Are they also created in God's image? And how do we try to understand and reconcile clobber verses in the Bible? Um, all people are created in God's image and that image of God can never be forfeited or lost, I believe. So, um, there's other things we can say that should help to securely protect the majesty and dignity of every person, such as here is a person for whom Christ came into the world, right? Here is a person for whom Christ died. Did anybody ever say, I remember somebody said this to me in my early Christian journey, if you were the only person in the world, Jesus would have come and would have died for you. Mm -hmm, yeah. uh, those kinds of statements remind us of how valuable each and every person is. Um, and one of the best things about Christian theology is that doesn't go away. Did anybody ever say there's nothing you can do to make God love you less? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? Right. Right. So um, the unconditionality of that kind of love, um, made in the image of God, sustained by the grace of God, offered redemption through the love of God, rescued by the blood of Christ, enrolled in the community uh, through baptism, uh, destined for eternal life. I mean, all those lovely things we say about the Christian journey, right? Um, so even if our theology still concludes that there's something wrong about gay or lesbian, bisexual or trans identity, um, all those other, which mine doesn't anymore, but um, all those other things that we've just said about the grandeur and worth of every person doesn't go away. So one thing I would ask anybody is, let's say your theology has remained unmoving on that question. Are you still treating the people in question as immeasurably sacred and valuable? Mm -hmm. And I deal with that in my book called The Sacredness of Human Life. I think it's um, that idea uh, is most challenged when groups are seen as most contemptible. It's easy for us to, to sweep them into the category of, oh, they're not really worthy of respect or dignity anymore, like uh, people on death row or something like that, right? Yeah. You know? yeah. Um, I have concluded that, um, that sexual orientation and gender identity diversity is a, is a mysterious reality of human nature, um, that in any 500 people, you're going to find three to 5% who are just wired differently than the majority. Um, and that it was wrong on the part of the church to make that category of differentness be associated with sin. It should be understood as differentness more like uh, left-handedness and right-handedness, skin color, language, ethnicity, uh, or, or uh, eye color. It's a given dimension of diversity. It's mysterious. Um, where the sin comes in for any of us is whether we misuse our sexuality to harm or to violate God's understanding of covenantal marital commitment. Um, so what I would argue in changing our mind is we should teach that everybody is invited to take their God-given good yet broken sexuality and gender selves and to live as faithfully to Jesus as we all can, including in relating to other people. Monogamy, fidelity, um, commitment. Um, if we open that demanding but beautiful ethic uh, to everyone, um, that we're on the right track. That's my argument. Um, 
but but again the, the more baby steps is um if we could just say look so here's our child and they're 14 and they say i think i might be a lesbian if our first step is nothing you have said today makes you any less sacred any less valuable any less loved by god any less loved by me and we'll figure out what to do about the rest of it on the journey together mm. Mm. David, there's a, a flood of questions coming in. <clears throat> One that's kind of near and dear to me. I like this. Uh, the, uh, uh, the writer says, um, how can we all collectively help create a world where books like Changing Our Mind and organizations like Embracing the Journey are no longer necessary? We like dreaming about that. <laughs> yeah, I, I totally agree. Um, well, we're in the process of, of attitude change right now. Um, attitude change is a dynamic thing. Uh, we will not be in the same place 25 years from now than we are as we are now. Um, I do think what tends to happen is if, let's say, let's say we're talking about the attitude of contempt for LGBT people, just say contempt, okay? Mm -hmm. Outright snarling contempt. I would say that if you're talking about North America, the percentage of people who respond to LGBT people with outright snarling contempt is much less than it was 25 years ago. Much less. And much less than it was 25 years before that. Mm. Right? Yeah. Uh, I mean, you had entire political campaigns um, based on demagoguing gay people as evil. That doesn't fly in the year 2022 the same way that it did in 1972 or 1952. Mm -hmm. so, so attitudes change, but that doesn't mean that the snarling contempt has disappeared. It just means there's less of it. Mm -hmm. um, more people have softened, more people have changed their mind. So leading one to hope that 25 years from now or 50 years from now, you wouldn't need books like this because the number of people who are doing snarling contempt is minuscule enough that you don't need organizations or books like this. But, but in general, attitudes of prejudice and, and contempt or, and, and, and then more, more broadly, doctrinal, things that are understood to be doctrinal matters, they don't change quickly, mm -hmm. right? And so yeah. you, need, you need various voices to help mediate processes of change towards a more, in, you know, more humane and accepting church, family, and world. And I mean, think about it. Think about our struggles with race. You know, will, will there need to be books on racism 50 years from now? Probably. 50 years ago, today, and 50 years from now. Uh, old habits die hard, old, old attitudes die hard. Um, and I think we're on the kind of the cutting edge of change on this issue. It's one reason why there's such interest in it, why our work is important. Mm. Yeah, no doubt about that. Well, there's another question from the audience um, that I'd like to share. This question is, many people in ministry say we are accepting and loving, but not condoning. Therefore, LGBTQ is welcome to attend, maybe even join, but never be leaders. How do you respond to that? Um, if you think of it as a, as a journey with um, various stages from snarling contempt to a wholehearted embrace, that attitude is better than, I notice you are gay, get out of here right? It's better than that, right? But the testimony of LGBTQ people themselves is mostly after a while, it's second class. Um, it's, it's not quite the same. Uh, so, and one can be, I mean, LGBTQ people can be fairly happy, maybe even for a long time in churches where the boundary line is welcoming, but not 
affirming. Um, but often something will happen that draws a line or makes it more difficult, like uh, volunteers are sought for working with the youth and then somebody volunteers, then they're told that they're not welcome, right? Yeah. Um, or somebody feels really called to ministry. Maybe there's a, a lot of talk in church about the call to the ministry and somebody feels really called to ministry and they demonstrate all the gifts, but then I think I might be gay. Oh, uh, I guess not then for you, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, so it's an unstable position. In a sense, it's an in-between position. It's better than snarling rejection. Um, but if you're the person on the receiving end of it, it certainly doesn't feel as, as, as um, comfortable or as fully a place to be who one is and to exercise one's gifts as would a place be where that wasn't still how things were, right? Right. So I, I think of it as a transitional place for a lot of churches. And I would think that a lot of them over the next generation will will take the next step. Mm. And some of them won't. Mm. Um, uh, so to the audience, um, you know, we got started tonight late, um, about 20 minutes. Um, so I'm saying it's uh, 8.50 here. Uh, we're going to plan to go to 9.15. We're going to run a little bit over, <clears throat> excuse me, this evening um, to try to get to as many of your questions as we can. Uh, David, something that um, uh, we encounter, our team encounters all the time, right? Because we, we're blessed to, to have so many uh, parents who have LGBTQ kids reach out for help. And um, oftentimes it's not, it's not long before the parent um, wants to embrace the situation but there's that troubling thing about what about those clobber verses, right? And I know that that can be a that could be a <laughs> that could be a, a long, long conversation. But could you could you speak to that just a little bit in terms of for the parents who are trying to lean into this, but their friend says, well, you know, Leviticus says this, or right? Could you talk a little bit to that? Yeah. Um, I mean, the best thing I could do is point people to uh, changing our mind. I have. I have a chapter each on the Sodom and Gomorrah story, the Leviticus passages, um, uh, 1 Corinthians 6, uh, and Romans 1, and so on. A um, couple of things I would say. One is, it's, it's actually not that much material. Um, there is far less even, even getting into the neighborhood of... of what today we would call lesbian or gay issues than there would be like on slavery and not even close on something like money. Um, so, so it's a, it's a minor theme um, in scripture. Um, where you have condemnations, it's not exactly clear why. Um, I think especially, I mean, the focus is on um, male same-sex activity and um, I think when one looks in cultural context, it's interesting to think about what the reasons might have been for it. Uh, associations, for example, with uh, pagan um, ritual or uh, cultic practices of the foreign uh, countries around Israel. Um, the association of same-sex activity with the degradation of one man by another in war or in abuse and violence. Um, uh, the idea that uh, sex was fundamentally about procreation, and so what would be wrong about male same-sex activity would be the spilling of the seed that didn't have a procreative purpose. Um, these, are, these are interesting things that the scholars um, consider, and then you move to the New Testament, and you have especially that Romans 1 passage, you have plenty of evidence that, that the, Roman, the Roman environment, especially around the, um, the emperor, was an environment of extreme degradation and debauchery in which um, upper-class men could essentially assault or sexually dominate any human being that they wanted to. For example, in the household, the man was understood to have sexual rights to anybody in the household, male or female, young or old. 
and um and if romans as we know was written to a community that had a lot of former slaves in it then what they would know about same-sex activity would be sexual abuse uh in the home of their former masters or current masters or the debauchery of of, of people like Nero who threw these wild parties in which everybody was having sex with everybody and the men, uh, the leading men could do whatever they wanted to. I am convinced that, that the forcefulness of the condemnations in those few verses are related to those cultural and contextual factors. Um, because wouldn't we, all of us, share the condemnation of male anal rape as an instrument of torture or uh, subjugation, right? It's awful. Right. Um, or of um, children or slaves being assaulted, maybe ruined uh, physically by men who were just having, having more uh, debauchery in their lives to go with their wives, prostitutes, and concubines, right? Or uh, powerful people around the emperor basically flaunting their power by abusing whoever they get their hands on. Um, so let's say we all agree that all of those things are awful. It'd be like being against uh, sexual assault, rape, torture, and rape as a, as a weapon of war, um, as well as just kind of licentiousness and debauchery. I'm against all of those things. The question is, those, if that is mainly what is going on in these forceful condemnations in these clobber passages, what do we make of, um, you know, Eve and Kathy, who have been partners for 20 years at church, and whose relationship is, is loving, um, faithful, non-exploitative, and a, a family for them, right? It's like comparing apples and oranges. We need to compare apples with apples. The, the, main, the main substantive theological concern in this area is this question. Did God really make a world in which some Adams don't go with Eves? You know, okay. some, um, they're just not made that way. Yeah. Um, or for that matter, some people who are classified as Adam aren't really Adam, they're actually Eve. So that you so you've got the gender piece and which I'm a little less certain about, and you've got the sexual orientation piece, which I'm very certain about. Um, there is a diversity in the world as we find it that our our creation theology has had a very difficult time coming to terms with. Mm. It's about a theology of creation. The fundamental text that probably really matters is. Genesis 1 and 2, God made them male and female, and the man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, right? Yeah. And what we have done with those passages is to take, is to assume that that is how God made everybody, because it's how God makes most people. But it's manifestly not how God made everybody. Right. So what about the 3 to 5% who are not wired that way? Well, what we have done is to construct that difference as sin. And but that's never, never made total sense because like when that 14 year old comes to you and says, mom, I've tried everything to be attracted to girls, but I'm really attracted to boys. I mean, have they been since they were nine years old, storing up sinful, uh, willful inclinations in their heart? I mean, did they wake up in the morning saying, I think I would like to make my life really, really difficult? Yeah. Um, so in other words, our theology, our interpretation of, of those passages has made it, has obscured the, the actual reality of the people that, that are LGBTQ. And so we've tried to force them into our construction of reality, and that has always brought tremendous harm. You know, um, so that, but it takes a while to to make that kind of paradigm shift and to say, oh, maybe the creation story was never intended to prescribe um, that this is how everybody's sexuality is supposed to work in the world. 
um, because it isn't how everybody's sexuality works in the world. It just isn't. And so what do we do with that? Um, so that's what it is. You've got, I think, saw a handful of really forceful passages that I think are related to odious cultural practices. Then you've got the main theological question of a creation structure that we have read, male and female, male for female, and then the reality of a, of a population that doesn't fit that paradigm. You know, um, there's another question that uh, I'm going to read to you. So, but before I do that, just to give you a little insight again to our parents that we walk with, most of them are really concerned about their child's salvation. And uh, this question is, how do you encourage your LGBTQ child's faith when they've been severely injured by the church? Um, that is another really, really important question. As a pastor, I want everybody within reach of the gospel to say yes to Jesus. Yeah. Right? I mean, yeah. my ordination certificate says gospel ministry, right? Yeah. I, want, I want people to believe in and love Jesus and to know that Jesus believes in and loves them, right? Um, but but um, ham-handed or, or not very successful efforts to deal with or, or really bad experiences when people come out has led to a lot of harm. And that harm has usually been articulated in the language of faith. You're going to hell. You're being a sinner. Repent right now. Satan's attacking you. God wants you, you know, all of that stuff, right? And, and so the whole arena of faith becomes an arena of of trauma. And so, so in our efforts, or our parents' efforts, or our teachers' or pastors' efforts to have people be on the right path towards salvation, we've actually made our living relationship with Christ more difficult. Mm. And, and that is a tragedy. That I would say that is the ultimate tragedy that your group is addressing. Mm -hmm. the next your penultimate tragedy the one layer below that is uh, an understanding of christian teaching that alienates parents from their own children right. like that story i told you about the parents kicking the girl literally down the stairs and out wow yeah yeah i i just i i keep when you said that i, I was thinking would jesus do that <laughs> you know right he came right. down and, and beat us. Um, yeah, so the, I, yeah, so can I just, so um, to, so to answer that original question, I would just say there's reparative work that would need to be done in the heart of a child who has been wounded by the church or by representatives of the church. We can say all day long, Jesus loves you better than that. Yeah. Um, I hope you'll give him another try. But it's a it's a it's a therapeutic and healing process that not everybody is ready to do at any at any particular time. Right. But far better for us not to inflict the harm in the first place. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Hey, David, um, uh, a question just popped in, um, uh, pointing to uh, a little while ago. You mentioned that you were certain about. Um, the sexuality piece, but uh, not uh, as certain about the gender piece. And, um, uh, and it's, it seems that it says it's spun a lot of confusion among trans parents, uh, wondering what you meant by that. Oh, sorry. Um, what I mean is um, the research on this, this dimension is newer. Um, the, the body of literature is, is more thin. Um, and um, the theological issues are a little bit different, right? Um, the main issue that, that people ask about, ask me about related to lesbian, gay, and bisexual is what, um, what sexual relationships are acceptable, right? So it, it gets mainly pitched as a sexual ethics issue. Um, 
issues around uh, transgender are don't really begin as issues about what sexual relationships are acceptable. Um, they begin as um, how how does one make sense of a person who has a disconnect between the gender to which they have assigned they have been assigned and the gender which they believe is their proper identity and what to do about that with it if it is persistent and what about transitioning and and uh, the various means of transitioning it's an entirely different set of issues right at, at a kind of a concrete level it's an entirely different set of issues and um i for example am still studying and thinking about like, well, when when does one, you know, begin that kind of transition process and that, uh, what should best practices be there and what are the clinicians saying? And now we've got, it's all politicized, you know, it's become a major issue of legislation in various states and stuff. Um, so that area is, is um, raises different questions, but what is not different is this is my child who I love. This is God's child who God loves, mm -hmm. made in the image of God, somebody for whom Christ died, yes. somebody who is infinitely precious, somebody who I need to go on the journey with, mm. right? Um, somebody who I need to protect from those who would be contemptuous towards them. Mm. Somebody who I need to, um, to continue to learn from. Things I never expected to have to learn I'm learning because I love my child mm. right so I hope that clarifies it the the details of the moral questions are a little bit different um in both cases you're dealing with kind of some clinical dimensions some kind of you know psychological social sociological kinds of things but the fundamental theological commitment should remain the same mm. yeah I, I hope that clarifies mm. Here's another question for you, David. Can you speak to the word homosexual in the Bible and when it was first introduced? I get pushback that Jesus spoke directly about this word when in fact it did not even exist until the 19th century. Um, it is true that that word uh, did not exist in English, I think, until the 19th century. It didn't make it into an English translation of the Bible until I think it was the Revised Standard Version, maybe. Um, I have not made a really close study of this. Um, I know that Kathy Baldock has done some research on this issue. Right. Um, basically, uh, it's a really interesting example of how um, of how Bible translation always involves leaping across cultures and um and cultures evolve so we see through a glass darkly when it comes to what was going on in like 1500 bc or whatever right um right. and and then so you have these you have these hebrew words or these greek words and then um and then you attempt a translation and and then you realize that the translation in English has itself become outdated because uh, we use different vernacular to discuss this reality now. I mean, the word homosexual um, was like the main word used for a period of time, but you notice it has gone out of use. And now we say lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, or LGBT or LGBTQ. That's a relatively recent development. And who knows whether in 20 years the vernacular will, will change. And precisely because translations of the Bible reflect the vernacular of their era, um, uh, then they capture a moment in time. Mm. And then that moment may change. Mm. So, so, and a lot of times, one, one major difference is, it sure looks like what the, the verses in the, um, in the Bible were mainly talking about was, was not people of a certain identity. This was unknown but it was acts that were seen to be forbidden. And I think the primary act that was seen to be odious was anal sex between men. And especially that which had to do with uh, domination, exploitation, and abuse. So, um, so, I mean, they're not really gonna say that like in every verse, but that seems to be the background noise, mm. right? 
yeah. the background context within which the within which the few discussions uh, are offered in the Bible. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. David, when um, when we encounter parents, um, most of them um, have uh, they they feel like their world's been rocked, yeah. and um, and. Uh, oftentimes, uh, by getting them in community with other parents who are in similar journeys, uh, it's amazing how quick uh, healing starts to happen. And so we pretty routinely watch parents trying to embrace um, the situation they find themselves in. Um, they recognize at some point, if they don't embrace it, they prolong their pain. Um, and of course, what we know is that if they prolong their pain, they prolong the child's pain. Right. So, um, but as they try to lean in, there's lots of confusion, right? There's the, the clobber versus um, one of the questions here is um, a, 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 one of uh, an audience per, a person within the audience writes, so many evangelicals hate Pride Month. How can we use this month um, to bring awareness to the hurt caused by rejecting these children? And I think that's just a classic example where um, we don't know what we don't know. Right. I mean, could you speak a little bit to that? Um, I, I think that, well, I know from your material that you recognize and help people to recognize that there is a coming to terms journey on the part of the parents. Yes. And, um, and it is fundamentally disorienting at the beginning. And then there's a process and in and, and any, in any, situation like this having a community um to process stuff with is really really helpful um uh, in our own family's experience we have some some specific issues not uh lgbt related mainly um in my media family but but where support groups around specific kinds of challenges have been absolutely indispensable mm. um and you're on this journey together, just sometimes just one hour with people who've been on that same journey. It's like, oh, wow, we're not alone. And you can share ideas and it just feels better to know that you're not alone, right? Sure. Um, but yeah, I think that um, that I know, I just did an event uh, this past weekend related to uh, a Pride Week uh, in uh, Maryland. I was in Annapolis, Maryland and they were doing pride and then there was a, a a church service that was attempting to to open the arms of the community's churches to the lgbt people who were there and um it was interesting you know the it is <laughs> let's just say it is not something that i as an evangelical pastor ever thought i would be doing um but it is where love has taken me yeah and, and where love takes a parent is to is to where the kids are and and to what it requires to understand them and to love them. And where love takes us as a pastor is sometimes into the streets of a pride festival to see how LGBTQ people are expressing themselves as they attempt um, to communicate their dignity, their personalities, their their hurt, their 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 own journeys, right? Yeah. Um, and so a posture of, um, God, what do you want to teach me here? I think is the right posture. I know one thing that happened uh, when I was getting ready to speak at this event in Annapolis, the organizer of, of Pride Week was given the platform for just a minute. And this person said, tremblingly, it has been a long time since I've been in a church. Mm. And it's because, well, you all know what it's because. And they could, you know, barely get the words out. And, and that was pretty much just before it was my turn to speak, right? Mm -hmm. You know, um, responding to the pain of our fellow human beings and trying to understand its sources and how it is being processed by them, beginning with our own children, is always the right thing to do. Mm. You know, I I know we're getting close to that nine and nine thirteen time, but I really, being that you just said this, this next question, and this is pretty common themes that are are being said and asked. Um, uh, the, a common question here about about church. 
what are ways to help move the narrative forward in conservative spaces? Any advice for how to nudge a, sh a church a step or two along the journey? Mm. Um, I can't do much better than to recommend um, the two things that are kind of on the table tonight. I mean, one is parents and families um, are a unique path into this issue for churches. Yeah. This is not the pastor just sitting in the study, looking at a few verses and declaring something. This is people who have a stake, yeah. right? Um, and so I think the small groups around families are a pivotal new strategy for moving churches along at least towards humaneness, at least towards an end of casual anti-gay stuff being dropped into sermons and then moving on from there, right? Yeah. right. <clears throat> um, the other thing is my book was intentionally written in a step-by-step-by-step -by -step -by -step method. Can we acknowledge that there are gay people? Can we acknowledge that some of these are Christians? Can we acknowledge that demagoguery and hatred is bad? Um, and just, I call these like... Uh, forks in the road can we can we go to this fork and make the right move and then do the next one and then do the next one and then do the next one so like the book is 20 chapters long and we haven't even begun the kind of rethinking the clobber verses i call them the big six um until like chapter 10 or something you know so at every step in any issue you want to make incremental progress right you always want to get to the next step and say, here's the new floor. We're not falling below this. Good. Hold that ground and then do the next thing. Like that. Hold that ground and then do the next thing. Um, and and I think that's how you do it step by step. Well said. Well said. It is. David, as um, is, uh, is we look to wrap up, um, uh, for people who'd like to follow you, um, maybe if you could just talk a little bit about how they can find you and if they want to connect, um, how do you recommend that? Sure. Um, and I hope you'll send this along. I have a, a, a really active website, davidpgushy.com. Um, there's not very many gushies in the world. It was a made up name from two French immigrants in 1699. So you should not forget the name, davidpgushy.com. And then you can sign up uh, for an email list there to get my monthly blast, sometimes more often. I'm also active on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram under at DP Gushy. And all my books are on Amazon uh, and then with the original publishers. Um, Front Edge Publisher has been a tremendously supportive publisher for this book, Changing Our Mind. I hope you'll check them out as well. Um, so that, that's probably sufficient on that. Uh, and, and by the way, changing our mind uh, just hit twenty five thousand sales. Was that accurate? Right now, the sales are accelerating. Um, yeah, and you know, it's it's a global thing. If I go anywhere, Australia, I'll be in Zurich, Frankfurt this this uh, fall, talking about these exact issues. Um, all over the world, these conversations are happening. All over the world. And, yeah. yeah. I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, so yeah, twenty five thousand, um, uh, and I'm I'm grateful. It hasn't been easy, uh, but it's been the journey that God led me on. I'm sure of it. Mm -hmm. We we get excited about the twenty five thousand copies because for us that represents at least twenty five thousand families, um, you know, exponentially being impacted by this mm -hmm. conversation. So, um, so for folks, as we uh, look to wrap up this evening, uh, just a couple things. Um, first of all, uh, we hope that uh, you found uh, this evening's um, uh, program not only educational, um, but hopefully you find yourself walking away uh, with uh, renewed hope uh, uh, where you and your child are, uh, or children um, are on your journeys. Um, a reminder uh, that we're here for you. Um, we uh, currently have 22 plus um, parent care groups that we operate across the whole bunch of time zones. Uh, with over 400 um, uh, Christian parents that participate in them. If you'd like to be part of that community, uh, let us know. Um, if you'd like to have more conversation about the things we uh, discussed this evening, uh, let us know that as well. 
uh, one of our uh, coaches or counselors will uh, get in touch with you when you reach out. So um, with that said, Lynn, anything else as we wrap up? Uh, no, uh, just for, there's some questions about, you know, how to start a group in their own church. And, yeah. and if you have that question, why don't you, if you could reach out to us personally and we can lead you on that way because we do have um, a committee who specifically is working on getting Embracing the Journey um, groups in, in the church. Yeah, we, we, we actually have a number of church partnerships um, today and a whole bunch uh, that we're uh, onboarding right now and, and more to come. So if you're a pastor uh, or ministry leader and you'd like to bring a parent support group to your church, we're happy to do it. And um, uh, we're, we're, we're open sourced. We'll give you everything we know. And um, uh, we'd love to be part of that uh, conversation with you. So with we that. Did. Yeah, David, thank you for your time, for your heart, and for having the courage to um, have conversations with people who are struggling with this issue. We are just grateful for you. And You're very welcome. Thanks for the opportunity, and thanks for your ministry, which I believe is indispensable, indispensable work. So thanks for letting me be a partner with you. David, would, would you... Um... Uh, just say a prayer for the folks who are with us tonight. Yes. Thank you. Dear God, uh, I pray that uh, all the words that I have said and that others have said tonight are pleasing to you, that they have reflected um, the fruit of the Spirit, uh, the love of Jesus, and the, the dignity of all people made in the image of God. I pray that... Um, these who are parents of LGBTQ kids will be renewed in their desire and will to love their children as their children need to be loved. Um, I pray for, for them to have resilience and teachability and to go into frontiers they never thought they would go, to deal with the, the grief and the, uh, you know, the, the loss and, and the challenge, but to, to trust that you're leading them on a good journey a journey that will be beautiful in, in the end if they will just stay on it. Above all, uh, may they not allow any breach to, if at all possible, to, to open up between themselves and their children. And uh, may they push their churches to be safe and loving places for all, including their own children. Um, we pray for the progress of this particular issue in the life of the church and in the world, and that those who are on this journey in this room uh, this evening, uh, we'll be able to be equipped to make a constructive difference there. We pray for Greg and Lynn and their ministry, for their team, uh, for each of the small groups, um, for the sacred work of love, and um, for the sake of the love of God, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, my friend. Yes, thank you. Truly, You're very welcome. Truly a wonderful evening, so thank you. Good night, folks. Good night.